If someone asked me where Napoleon was born, I could answer Napoleon was born in Corsica. In daily life, it would not be felt that there was anything mysterious or paradoxical in this remark, yet to philosophical reflection, it can easily seem so. Or consider this, Napoleon is dead, he no longer exists. The philosophical complexity is, how can I think of someone or something that does not exist? How was it possible for me to refer to, to mean, Napoleon himself? In his writings after the early 1930s, Wittgenstein pays a lot of attention to the philosophical impression that thought and thinking are mysterious. In the philosophical investigations, he says, this strange thing thought, that's in quotation marks, and then he goes on to say, but it does not strike us as strange when we are thinking. He means when we are thinking in uh, ordinary life, in the daily run of life. It only strikes us as strange when we are thinking philosophically. Wittgenstein goes on to say, thought does not strike us as mysterious while we are thinking, but only when we say, as it were, in retrospect, how is that possible? How is it possible for thought to deal with the very object itself? It seems to us as if we had captured reality with our thought. Unquote. <clears throat> Intending something, planning something, wishing for something, remembering something, expecting something, understanding something. All of these are forms of thought. <clears throat> In each there is an object, that which is intended, planned, wished for, expected, remembered, understood. If I intend to construct, to build a garden, then the garden does not yet exist. So how can it be the object of my intention? If I remember an event that occurred a month ago, that event no longer exists. So how can it be the thing I remember. An answer to which philosophers have felt driven is to say that the ostensible or apparent object can't, uh, thought cannot be the immediate object of thought. There must instead be some substitute or replacement for it in the present thought. In his uh, Philosophers of America, the first book that Wittgenstein wrote after his return to philosophical research, it would seem that he was tempted by this position. For he says there, quote, if I wish that P were the case, then of course, P is not the case, and there must be a substitute for P in the state of wishing, as indeed in the expression of the wish." Unquote. Consider an example. If I wish it would stop raining, then the rain has not stopped. Therefore the situation of the rains having stopped 
cannot be in my state of wishing, but only some substitute for it. Would this mean that I do not actually wish for the rain to stop, but instead for something else? One cannot extract much from this brief remark in the American Women. If Wittgenstein did have this temptation, I think it was momentary. For on the next page he says, quote, If one were to ask, do I expect the future itself or only something similar to the future, that would be nonsense, unquote. If I say I expect snow tomorrow, that sentence is an expression of an expectation and of a thought. The object of expectation and of thought is spelled out in the words snow tomorrow. If I cannot expect snow tomorrow, but only something similar to it, what might that be? Would it be rain or mist tomorrow? But that would be a different expectation. It is indeed nonsense to say that you cannot expect the future, but only something similar. This has an implication for wishing, too. My wish that the rain would stop is focused on the rain's stopping, not on something similar. In philosophical thinking about memory, there has always been a tendency to conclude that past events and situations cannot be the immediate objects of memory. It has seemed that what is present in memory, or to memory, cannot be the past event which we say we remember, but must be only a representation of it. In uh, Russell's book, The Analysis of Mind, he says, quote, the past event which we are said to be remembering is unpleasantly remote from the content that is the present mental occurrence in remembering. Unpleasantly remote. And he says also, remembering has to be a present occurrence in some way resembling or related to what is remembered. Unquote. So, so we have to provide some substitute some representation in the present mental event of remembering, some substitute for the past event which is said to be remembered. And the most popular candidate for the required representation is, of course, an image. And uh, Russell said in the uh, analysis of mind. Memory demands an image. That's a quotation. Memory demands an image. Memory images are supposed to be copies more or less accurate of past events. They are supposed to bridge the gap between the present occurrence of remembering and the no longer existing past event. They are the substitutes, surrogates, representatives for the past events, which, it seems, cannot be present to thought. But can any view be satisfactory that replaces the ostensible object of thought with a representation? Surely not. Let us go back to the example of Napoleon. I said to someone, Napoleon was born in Corsica. It was argued that Napoleon himself could not be the object of my thought, but that the actual object present in or to my thought was a representation 
government voters. If that were so, would I be saying that my representation of Napoleon was born in Corsica? Perhaps for Corsica also, I would need a representation. For although Corsica presently exists, it is a very large island composed of many forests, cliffs, boulders, huge boulders. How could all or any of that be in my mind? So if my thought contains representations for both Napoleon and Corsica, is what I'm saying this, that a representation of Napoleon was born in a representation of Corsica? Uh, and of course this would not be the end of the substitution that was need to be made. The outcome would be that the original simple statement that Napoleon was born in Corsica would be turned into a complex and nonsensical mixture of representation. An expression of expectation <coughs> is an expression of a thought. Suppose you see someone pointing a gun. You say, I expect a bang. The gun is fired. The bang occurs. Wittgenstein asks in the investigation, was that bang already in your expectation? Was that bang? You expected a bang. Was that bang already in your expectation? This question is embarrassing. You expected the sound of a gun. It seems that either this sound was in your, was there in your expectation, or it was not. But then we are caught on the horns of a dilemma. If we say that the sound of the shot was there in your expectation, then it seems that this sound occurred before the gun was fired, which is ridiculous. If we say that the bang of the gun was not in your expectation, then it seems that the bang that occurred when the gun was fired could not have fulfilled your expectations. Furthermore, suppose you said the report was not so loud as I had expected. Wittgenstein asks again in the investigation. Then was there a louder bang in your expectation? The question is comical, yet is presented with serious intent. It confronts us with the absurdity of the suggestion that there were two bangs, one louder than the other. It makes us aware of our confusion about the concept of expectation. Now, what is it that draws us into this confusion? Not just about expectation, but more generally about the concept of an object of thought. Wittgenstein provides a clue in the next remark in the investigations, he asked us to consider the two sentences, here is a red patch and there is no red patch here. He then remarks that, quote, the word red occurs in both, so this word cannot signify the presence of something red, unquote. I think this remark is the key to our problem about the object of thought. We are strongly attracted by the assumption that the meaning of a word is something that corresponds to the word. For example, we are inclined to think that the meaning of the word red is something red. But this cannot be so when the word red occurs in the sentence, there is, there is nothing red here. 
we cannot even say that the meaning of red is the existence of red color. For if a, a radical chemical change in the atmosphere had the effect that the color red no longer existed, the word red would not thereby lose its meaning. It would make sense to say there used to be red color, but there isn't any now. Similarly, in the sentence, I expect the sound of a shot. The meaning of the phrase, the sound of a shot, cannot be the occurrence of the sound of a shot, since the same phrase occurs in the sentence, I do not expect the sound of a shot. Early in the investigations of Wittgenstein, as you know, criticized the assumption that the meaning of a word is something that corresponds to the word. He said there in the investigation, paragraph 40, that the word meaning is used incorrectly if one designates by it the thing that corresponds to the word. And he went on to say, this is to confuse the meaning of a name with the bearer of the name. Now, Napoleon bore the name Napoleon, but he was not the meaning of the name, for when he died, his name did not lose its meaning. In the, in the remarks I just quoted from Wittgenstein, he was, I think there was referring primarily to proper names, but the remarks have a wider application to general names such as red or pain, to phrases such as the sound of a gun, and even to full sentences, it is raining the phone rang, and so on. Sentences that are used to describe the states of affairs. I am suggesting that when we think philosophically about the meaning of a proper name, or of, of proper names, or, or general names, or phrases, or sentences, expressions, for short, expression, when we think about the meaning of our foremost inclination is to suppose that the meaning of an expression is something, event, situation, or state of affairs, something that exists. But various considerations make us realize that this initial conception cannot be right. Some of these considerations are the following. Uh, one consideration is uh, mistaken assertions, false, false judgments. For example, you said it is raining, but you were wrong. So what existing state of affairs could be the meaning of your statement? Or uh, secondly, consider wishing, hoping, planning, intending, expecting, predicting, and so on. The, the thing or situation hoped for intended, expected, and so on, typically does not yet exist. Therefore, the meaning of the expressions we use to refer to those objects of thought cannot lie in something presently existing. The third, third consideration, memory and thought about the past. When the past things or situations no longer exist, it would seem that our thought cannot be dealing with those things themselves. And the fourth consideration, negation and denial. For example, you say P is false or it is not the case that P, the sentence P is contained in your total assertion, but if the meaning of P is the state of affairs P, then it seems that your whole assertion is a contradiction. Negation appears to be 
and incoherent concepts. If, despite these difficulties, we cling to the assumption that the object of thought must be something that coexists with the thought and is present in the thought, then we have to devise some substitute, some surrogate for what we originally took to be the object of thought. The surrogate has to have two properties. First of all, it must presently exist, and second, it must resemble, be similar to, in some way, that which was originally conceived to be the object of thought. This is why, in philosophical thinking about memory, it has so frequently been supposed that remembering demands an image, as Russell said. Now, of course, when we remember, we do sometimes have memory images. And this fact perhaps makes it easier to swallow the assumption that genuine remembering requires an image. The postulated image must have the two necessary properties of being first something that exists when we remember and be something that more or less resembles the past thing or event which we assume was the immediate object of memory before we ran into difficulty. Wittgenstein illustrates our temptations in these areas with many examples. He says in the investigations, quote, perhaps one has the feeling that in the sentence, I expect he is coming. One is using the words he is coming in a different meaning than in the assertion he is coming. But if it were so, how could I say that my expectation had been fulfilled? That is, the, the one is tempted to say that uh, at the in the sentence I expect he is coming, the words, he is coming, which occur in that sentence, mean something different than they do in the assertion, he is coming. And why does that feeling exist? It arises from the assumption that the meaning of the words, he is coming, is the actual occurrence of his coming. And so we conclude that those words cannot mean the same in the expression of expectation since I can expect his coming even if he doesn't come. If we had not made that assumption about the meaning of the words, he is coming, we would not have had the inclination to think that they mean something different in the expression of expectation. Uh, and... Uh, and, and now let us consider a remark about negation that Wittgenstein makes. Quote, the feeling is as if the negation of a proposition had first to make it true, had, had first to make the proposition true in a certain sense in order to negate it. The feeling is as if the negation of a proposition had first to make it true in a certain sense in order to negate it, unquote. But why do we have this temptation? Because the assertion, it is not true that it is, it is snowing, contains the words, it is snowing. And we have the inclination to think that the meaning of these words is the occurrence of snow. We realize, however, that it is too absurd to suppose that a negation really contradicts itself. So what we vaguely assume is that the meaning of the words, it is snowing, as they occur in the negation, 
it is not snowing, or it is false that it is snowing. We vaguely assume is that the meaning of the words, it is snowing as they occur in the negation, is not actual snowing, but something resembling it. <coughs> Uh, perhaps a mental image of snowing. And here are other examples provided by Wittgenstein in the investigations. If I say I did not dream last night, still, uh, this, this first sentence is in, in quotes, this is uh, something you imagine somebody saying. If I say I did not dream last night, still I must know where to look for a dream. That is, the sentence I dreamt applied to the actual situation may be false, but must not be senseless. At the end of the quoted statement. And then Wittgenstein comments, Does that mean that you did, after all, feel something, as it were, the suggestion of a dream? which made you aware of the place which a dream would have occupied. Or, if I say I have no pain, I have no pain in my arm, does that mean that I have a shadow of a feeling of pain, which as it were suggests the place where pain could have entered? Unquote. This questioning is brilliant. Must I feel a shadow of pain, perhaps a very slight pain, in order to acknowledge that I am not in pain? These examples, the suggestion of a dream, the shadow of a pain, are like the image of a past situation in remembering it, and like the mental representation of Napoleon when he is the subject of our conversation. We seem to be under the influence of the following conception. When we speak and when we take in the words of another speaker, we are understanding something. And that something must be there, present to our understanding simultaneously with our hearing or uttering the words each word has a meaning, so we grasp the meaning of each word as the sentence flows past. In, in, the, in the volume called Zeth, Wittgenstein says of this conception, quote, We don't get away from the idea that the sense of a sentence accompanies the sentence is there alongside of it. Unquote. In the investigations, he, he says similarly, we don't escape from the notion that using a sentence consists in our thinking of something with each word. Unquote. These ideas to which Wittgenstein refers are a misrepresentation of actual discourse in language. If someone says to me, please open the window, I will respond without considering the meaning of each word. As Wittgenstein remarks in the investigation, quote, when I think in language, meanings don't go through my mind alongside the verbal expressions, but the language itself is the vehicle of thinking, unquote. The point is that in our normal discourse, when we speak and respond to the words of others, this exchange does not have to be supplemented by something mental, neither by images of the things that are the subjects of the discourse, nor by silent thoughts about the meanings of the words employed in the discourse. Sometimes images do occur, and sometimes they assist 
understanding. If someone is trying to tell me how to get to a certain street in London, it may help me if I visualize the layout of the streets. Also, it sometimes happens in conversation that an unfamiliar word is used and I struggle to think of its meaning. But the mention of such incidents merely emphasizes how infrequent they are in proportion to the number of situations in which communication in language takes place with no reliance on imagery and with no thought of the meanings of the words. If a friend said to me, my head still aches, I might reply, you'd better take some more aspirin without the intervention of an image of aspirin or of a shadow of pain or of any silent thinking about the meaning of his or my words. My reply, the words I spoke, showed my understanding of what he said. He uttered some words. I responded with some words. That may be all that took place. In this connection, Wittgenstein makes some remarks that are amusing in their slyness and their cunning. Quote, if I give someone an order, it is for me quite enough to give him signs of his words. And I would never say, this is only words, and I must get behind the words. Equally, when I have asked someone something, and he gives me an answer, that is, a sign. I am satisfied. <clears throat> that was what I expected. And I don't object. That's a mere answer. Unquote. This conception is difficult to accept. It may seem that Wittgenstein and I in agreement with him are holding the people in conversation, are merely uttering sounds and not meaning anything by them. But of course this isn't so. The friend who said that his head still aches meant what he said, and when I replied that he should take more aspirin, I meant what I said. The point is, however, that this meaning what was said was not something that was present alongside of or in addition to the uttering of the words. The objection one feels can be put by saying that the uttered sounds are in themselves from human conventions and practices. It would not point. What is false is that there must be something mental, psychical, and at the meaning added to the drawn arrow. If you were following a trail through the woods marked by arrows painted on trees and rocks, when you came upon an arrow, there would be no act of interpretation or of thinking to yourself. I am supposed to go that way. You would just go that way. Early in life, you were taught the use of arrows as direction indicator. You learned to take your direction from an arrow. So now you do respond to an arrow in the way you were taught. The beauty of the example of the arrow is that what is true of it is also true of, of a sentence of language. Someone says to you, turn to the right. The words in themselves do, do not mean anything in themselves. But you grew up in a community where you were introduced to the peculiar institution of giving and obeying orders. You learned what an order is and what obeying an order is. 
just as you learned the use of signposts, you acquired mastery of these practices. Your acquired mastery of these practices enables you to respond with understanding, without the mediation of an inner, inner mental act. Of course, it could happen that a person turned right when the order to turn right was given. Uh, uh, but nevertheless did not understand the order. For this to be intelligible, however, we must suppose some special circumstances. Perhaps the order was given in a foreign tongue, and he turned right only in imitation of others. And it can happen that someone understands an order, but does not carry it out. For example, he does not acknowledge the authority of the person who gave the order, or he thinks that the order was given by mistake, or he is being rebellious, and so on. Explanations are needed for these failures. If someone asks, why should there be any connection at all between understanding of the order, turn right, and turning right? An answer would be, if there was no connection, then it would not be the order to turn right. We sometimes say, in, in uh, actual life, I must understand the order before I can carry it out. That's often, often I have to understand the order before I can carry it out. This may make it appear that understanding an order must always intervene between hearing it and executing it. Uh, there's a philosophical um, inclination to say that it, in all, whenever you are given an order, there must intervene between your hearing the order and you're carrying it out and a mental event of understanding. Now that, that philosophical inclination is, um, is stimulated uh, by the fact that in ordinary life there are many occasions and they say, I can't carry out the order because I don't understand it yet. I have to understand it before I can carry it out. So that, so that the, what we're talking about is the philosophical impulse to, to hold that whenever an order is given to you, you must understand it before you can carry it out. Understanding must intervene between hearing it and carrying it out. But this isn't so. One case in which the, this remark w w would be made in ordinary life would be where the order required a number of steps, say. It's a very complicated order. And I have to arrange the sequence of <coughs> steps in my mind before I can carry out the order. Another case would be that the order was given in a, in a code of some sort, which I must first decipher. Still another case would be when the order is uh, unexpected, and I have to first make, uh, make certain that it was seriously meant. So that the remark, I must understand it before I can carry it out, has an appropriateness that is limited to special circumstances. It provides no justification at all for the assumption that a mental phenomenon of understanding must always come between receiving an order 
and executing it. Not all thinking takes place in language, but much of it does. What worries us philosophically is the feeling that the language cannot be enough. You utter some words, I utter some words. Surely there must be more to a conversation than just that. Something must be added to the words, namely meaning. But how does meaning get into the words? One answer we have considered is that the meaning of an expression is some existing thing, event, or state of affairs. For example, the meaning of the expression a storm is the occurrence of a storm. But this won't do, for I might have said there is a storm outside, or I expect a storm when there was no storm. Those sentences had sense, even though there was no storm to serve as the meaning of the expression. A storm. The next answer is to postulate some mental representation of a storm as being the meaning of the expression, a storm. But this won't do either. A mental representation of a storm is not what I expect when I expect a storm. The attempt to find the meaning of an uttered expression in something coexisting with the utterance cannot succeed. Where then is the locus of meaning? In Wittgenstein's conception, there is a clear answer. The locus of linguistic meaning is the grammar of the language. In his work called Philosophical Grammar, he says, quote, Grammar is not accountable to any reality. Grammatical rules determine meaning, constitute it, and so they are not themselves answerable to any meaning, and to that extent are arbitrary. Unquote. And, and Wittgenstein goes on to give uh, two illustrations of this point in the philosophical grammar. He says, quote, There cannot be any question whether these rules or other ones are the correct ones for the word not, the word not, the word for negation. There can't be any question whether these rules or, or other ones are the correct ones for the word not, that is, whether they accord with its meaning. For what, without these rules, the word has as yet no meaning, and if we change the rules, then it has another meaning, or none, and in that case, we can just as well change the word too. And then he goes on to say, why don't I call the rules of cooking arbitrary, and why am I inclined to call the rules of grammar arbitrary? Because I think of the concept of cooking as defined by the purpose of cooking, but not of the concept of language as defined by the purpose of language. If you do not cook according to the correct rules, you cook badly. But if you follow other rules than those of chess, you are playing a different game. And if you follow other grammatical rules than the customary ones, you are not saying something wrong, but you are speaking of something else." Unquote. Now, Wittgenstein's remark that grammar is not accountable to any reality is a striking thought. It implies, for example, that the meaning of the word joy did not arise from the observation of the phenomenon of joy, 
Instead, the word you use to describe what you observe does not refer to joy unless it has the grammar of the word joy. One use of language can, uh, of course, be confusing and misleading. Wittgenstein is not using the word grammar to mean the kind of grammar that we learn in school. In his sense, in his sense the word grammar far more is comprised than syntax or sentence construction. In describing the grammar of an expression, you would be saying something about the part that the expression plays in the life of the people who use it. The grammar of the word promise, for example, pertains not just to the form of words in which promises are made, but also to the various circumstances that are relevant to whether a promise has actually been given. The grammar of the word promise pertains to the part that a promise plays in creating expectations. To what kinds of circumstances are called breaking a promise? To what counts as a reason for breaking a promise? <laughs> to how a promise differs from a forecast? To what part trust plays in the practice of making and accepting promises? To whether this practice could exist if promises were never kept. To describe the grammar of the word promise would be to describe a particular pattern of human behavior, a pattern which is a blend of words and actions. It is to describe, in Wittgenstein's happy phrase, a form of life. Once we understand Wittgenstein's use of the word grammar, the conception that the grammar of a word constitutes the meaning of the word is not so surprising. To master the use of a word is to master a lot of grammar. But that doesn't mean that you are able, on demand, to give an account of that grammar any more than you can give an account of how you balance on a bicycle or or tie your shoelaces. Someone employs a word in a way that strikes you as wrong, or odd, or funny. But that may be all you can say about it. Suppose someone says that the music of the Bach, St. Matthew, Passion, is delightful. You might reply, I wouldn't use that word. But to the question, why not, you may not be able to answer. Or you might say, that music is glorious. If you added, what is glorious is not delightful, that would be a grammatical statement. It would be a comment on the relationship between these two concepts. Let us return to the problem of the object of thought. When we think in language, the object of thought is given by the language we use. I say of someone, I expect he is coming. We have already noted a temptation to believe that the words he is coming have a different sense in this expression of expectation than in the assertion he is coming. And we have already noted Wittgenstein's observation that this cannot be right because then his coming would not fulfill my expectation. <coughs> adds these remarks, quote, But one could now ask, how does it, how does it look when, 
He comes. So how does it look when a person comes into the room? The door opens. Someone walks in. And so on. How does it look if I expect him to come? I walk up and down in the room, look at the clock now and then, and so on. But the one occurrence does not have the slightest similarity to the other one. So how can one use the same words in describing them? But perhaps I say, as I walk up and down, I expect him to come. Now there is a similarity at hand, but of what kind? Unquote. These superb remarks bring out the source of the feeling that there is no similarity between the description of the expectation and the description of his coming, but they also bring to light the actual similarity. The similarity between the two lies in the language. The linguistic expression of expectation contains the word, he is coming. I expect he is coming. It contains the word, he is coming. These words specify what is expected. So, of course, it's coming fulfills that expectation. This is settled solely by the grammar of the linguistic expression of expectation. Nothing else has anything to do with it. In an immediately following remark, Wittgenstein says, it is in language that expectation and fulfillment make contact. It is in language that expectation and fulfillment make contact. This is one of those remarks that are so full of significance that it seems impossible to unpack all of it. Here is contained the solution of how it is possible for you to think of Napoleon himself, even though he no longer exists. You achieved it simply by using the name Napoleon in a sentence. Nothing else is required. Neither that Napoleon should have some sort of shadowy existence, nor that you should have some mental representation of him. The language does the whole job. The same holds for the other difficulties about the objects of thought. When a desire is expressed in language, the language itself says what would satisfy that desire. A feeling of satisfaction or contentment does not come into it. If you are given an order, the language of the order determines what carrying out the order would be. When you express a memory in language, the language specifies the object of memory. No difficulty arises because of the present non-existent of the of the past event, nor is a memory image required, nor a feeling of pastness, as Russell believed. When we speak truthfully and without deceiving ourselves, the objects of our thought are what we say they are. There is no gap between our language and the objects of our thought, a gap that needs to be bridged by surrogates or representations or mental intermediaries, we can think of the very object itself, whether it exists or doesn't exist, so long as our language contains a name or description for it. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin.